I always am excited to see what's going to happen on Sunday. And I could tell you some stories, but I won't. But today will be one of those in the days ahead. If, you, if it's your first time with us today, thank you for being here. Uh, what a sweet time today has been. We are, we're literally going through the Bible and examining what it means to have a Jesus-centered life. And we literally, I just want to kind of recenter you if I can. We, we've discussed this whole idea that is found throughout the Old Testament and the New, that our life is bigger than just us. Like God uses and works in our lives, but we tend to live life so often as it's just about how my week's going to go or what I've got coming up or what my afternoon's going to be or the decisions that I make as though those are made in some kind of a vacuum that don't affect anybody else. And yet you probably to a person could stand and give testimony to how the good decisions of those before you have made an impact in your life in a good way. And the not as wise decisions in your life have impacted your life. Like We don't live life in a vacuum. And if we look at the, st the text of the scripture, it tells us that God created us for a purpose. It says that he actually, he actually did love us. I mean, he does love us. He, he, he wants to be with us. He wants to do life with us. He wants to, to walk with us daily. Sin is the problem. God sent Jesus to, 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 to ultimately to remedy that. But the reality for us is that we still get hung up in our, like whatever is happening at our address. I mean, we're, we're being honest, right? Like it is, today's date is March, it's March what? Is it the 6th? 5th. I'm lost. It's the 5th, okay? So um, as a result, we look at what we got going on that day, what the schedule is, what's the, the, what's the ball schedule the coming week, what is the evening time, at some point at your house, are y'all going to sit down and, and, and line out what we gotta, where we got to be and what we got to do this week? The point is that we have been literally seeing that you are one in a hundred billion plus that have ever lived even the new earth guys think it could have been a hundred billion like seven seven eight billion a day nobody's ever been like you none and of the ones that were even close in proximity and place they weren't in 2023 and yet here you sit a product of the experiences that you've had, the choices that you've made. But in this moment, God has a plan moving forward, and it's bigger than just us. As we've looked at Jesus' life and how he sought to express this to the Pharisees, we find that Jesus, is it fair to say Jesus was frustrated with the Pharisees? I mean, last time we gathered together, we, 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 we literally talked about how frustrated and how harshly he spoke with them. Well, he, he really wasn't the first to do that. Like, that came before that. Uh, because there were this group of, of folks called the prophets that came in the Old Testament, and almost unanimously, they had issues with what was happening with, 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 with the people of Israel, or, or with Judah, or the people that they were actually speaking to, but they had issues with the religious leaders of the day, like almost unanimously. In fact, that's why when Jesus spoke to the Pharisees about what their fathers and the fathers before them did to the prophets, he basically says, you've done no different, and you'll do no different to me. Um, if we flip back a few pages, and we're going to start in the Old Testament today to the book of Malachi, what we're going to find in the book of Malachi is that the book itself, the first two to three chapters are about what, well, two, two and a half chapters, excuse me, are about what the preachers were doing wrong, like how they were allowing things that they should not allow. But then there is this overarching theme of all these places where God's people as a group were saying, God, how can you be just and allow these evil people, not us, but these other people that are evil, do the things that they do if you're truly just and then you allow us who are not to not be blessed? Like, what use is there to serve you if in serving you the, 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 and being righteous, those that are not righteous get glorified? And Jesus' response is essentially uh, have you looked at your life lately? Uh, you're not near as righteous as you think you are. And so he has, he has a talk with them. Now I'm going to be, su like this is, I don't know how all this falls on the same day, but it does. Um, I have 
I'm overdue to talk about like what does the Bible say about fiscal responsibility, like finances, okay? And I promised y'all before this week that this was the week we're going to do it. We don't do this a lot, like probably never, like, like we're doing it today. And I'm hopeful we can record this thing. And I, I can just send it to you, you know, from now on. But, 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 but here's the reality. We got to know what the Bible says. And what I think is cool, I think most people really do want to know, like, what does the Bible really say about that part of our life? The reason that it matters is because the stewardship of life is often not right because our perspective of ownership of life is not right. So let me say it differently. Until we acknowledge to God that when we say you are Savior and you are Lord, that means he's in charge. That means he is king. That means his thoughts are not my thoughts. His ways are not my ways. His thoughts and his ways are illustrated for us in the word. And so we trust that what the Bible says is, is what it should be. And so then we look to the Bible for instruction about how to be and do. And that's not, like, that's not new to anybody. What I think is interesting is that we oftentimes don't actually know what the Bible teaches about some of these things. And so my goal today is really simple. One is I want you to be able to settle a question. Like I'm asking, like we, we had an incredible moment, but at the end of the day, if you get the question of who's in charge of your life right, before you leave here today, that God, you're in charge and I'm not. That means that every good thing I've done in my life, it's all praise to you because I'm not capable. And every hard thing I'm facing, Lord, I, not only can I not be pride, prideful because I could, I'm not good enough to have done it, I also cannot take ownership of all the bad because the fact of the matter is you're fixing to use that too. And I trust you with it. Like I trust you with the good and with the bad because as much of a mess as I am, Amen. Anybody? As much as a mess as I am, I'm your mess. Like, like God, I'm yours. So do with me as you will. Right? Like, if you can walk out of here with that, everything else is going to solve itself. And so my heart for you is for me to be able to, like, put truth in front of you. Not, like, as a pastor and one that loves you and wants to encourage you and wants you to be at your best and be a part of something bigger than you. Like, just put word in front of you and then allow God and, and his spirit to do what he does. The hard part is whether or not you are willing to, to, to look a little further and to actually I I accept that truth. So let's look first at Malachi. I'm going to run out of time if you're not careful. Let's look first at Malachi in chapter 3. And I'm going to give you a little section there. He's already talked about some other things, but he's going he's to get at the end towards this, this idea of ownership, which was a problem. One of the issues that he had with uh, the Pharisees of the day or the priests of the day is they were allowing the people, and I, it doesn't give me a ton of information like why. All I can assume is that they, want, they were trying to endear themselves to the people that were coming and bringing these, these offerings. And so they bring them a lamb. And, and like the, the issue was that the, the, the priest had begun to accept a lower standard. So like they bring, they got a whole flock of lambs and they're going to bring the blind one to the Lord. And then they'd accept, instead of saying, hey, this is not acceptable to God, which sounds kind of harsh for us to say it's not acceptable to God. But like he's, he said all along, he wants the best. They bring the blind one, the gimpy one. Can I use the word gimpy? That's not a Bible word, but y'all, it communicates real well around here. Y'all know what that means, right? Like, like not fancy at all, right? Like gimpy. And so, so, so they bring the gimpy one and the priest say, oh, thank you so much for bringing this gimpy animal before the Lord. This is an acceptable sacrifice when they should have said, hey, listen, God, God loves you, but this doesn't reach his standard. And so he, he took issues. He took issues about how they dealt with marriage and a whole bunch of other stuff, Okay. So now he's going, he's going to turn his, his head and, 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 say, and speak to the rest. This is God's response uh, through the one whose title was Malachi to God's people. And he says, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of, of, of Jacob, are not consumed. Let me just tell you what's beautiful. We sang that, that you, uh, you he, I don't remember the exact words. I fix words in songs a lot, and, and these I'm not fixing for the better. But you were, you are, you will be forever. Well, God doesn't change. Praise God, he doesn't change. Aren't we glad he doesn't change? But here's the problem. They're saying, God, you, you were dealing with us right, and now you're not dealing with us right now. And God's like, no, no, I was dealing with you right before, and you were wrong before, and you're still wrong. Let me show you. And so he says, I don't change. Uh, from the days of your fathers, you've turned aside from the statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says, like, I didn't leave, you left says the Lord of hosts, but you say, how should we return? And so he's get fixing to get specific. He said, will man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. You say, how have we robbed you? 
He says in tithes and contributions, tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. So he's including everybody. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord. Like, test me in this. Check me out and see if this isn't true. If I will open up the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer, like that which would come against your income. So that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field. So that it shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for they will, you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said that it's in vain to serve God. What is the profit in keeping his charge or walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and escape. Like, this is kind of heavy stuff, and I want to explain a, a couple of pieces of it. But here's what's beautiful. At the end, there's a response. These people, these people that, that, that heard the message from Malachi, they, they, they talked to each other. I don't know if it's kind of like, I'm not saying the ladies at the If Gathering were among those, like they were, they, they were sinners. I ain't saying that at all. But, but like, it's almost like they heard a message, and they actually talked amongst themselves about, yeah, this is what God is saying. So it says, then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. And the Lord paid attention, and he heard them. And a book of remembrance was written, like there was a response. The book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared him, or feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make my treasured possession. And I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. So the big picture at play here is that they wondered where was God, and God responded and says, I'm not the one that left. And then they returned, and God fulfilled what God always does when his people return to him. Now, in relationship, like this is the teaching part, where you've probably heard a lot and maybe even thought a lot and maybe even made some assumptions off of some things uh, over the years about uh, what the Bible literally teaches about giving. And I want to give you, if I can, just the clearest picture of what the Bible teaches on some of this. We're going to start with the Old Testament. I'm going to look at the New Testament. And I'm going to, I'm going to literally give some arguments, some, some answers to some arguments that I've heard over the years, and I've heard a bunch. Uh, but it, it, remember, if ownership is not resolved, till the question of ownership is answered, stewardship is never going to be right. Like, that's just how it works. Um, because... If he's not Lord, we're going, to have a, we're going to have an issue on the financial end. And so as you look at the text itself, there's some, some phrases that probably mean a lot but uh, to some, but maybe not. You've heard the word tithe. I don't think in the modern day most people even knows what, know what the word tithe means. It literally means a tenth. So if you've got ten, it means one out of ten. So if you've got ten dollars, one dollar out of ten. If you've got a bushel, a tenth of a bushel is what uh, is described when that word is used, just, and I'm not trying to confuse things, but just like the word baptize literally is a Greek word, verb that means to immerse or to dunk, anything different than that's not literally what the Bible teaches when it says that. Something different than a tenth is not a tithe. And so every gift you give unto the Lord, praise God for it, but just don't be mistaken to think that one out of every 55 is a tithe. It's not a tithe. It's one out of 55. It's a part of a tithe or maybe a gift that you would give if you ever gave it. Like, I'm not trying to be insulting. I'm telling you, it's not, it's not, it's not. It's not what the word means. Does that make sense? Now, if you wonder what the Old Testament standard was, it literally was more like 23% by, by the time you gave what you'd give to the temple, and then you give what you'd give in addition to that to help those great and greater needs. So if you wanted the letter of the law, it would be more than that. I'm not here today arguing on anybody's behalf for you to give to the letter of the law, because I don't want the letter of the law, and you don't want the letter of the law. I don't think. Do you? I mean, it, it, what we want is we want grace. And we're going to find there's a ton of grace in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, it was a letter. It was a, it was a place. And so um, when he speaks of the tithe, he's speaking of a tenth. Now, some have said, and it's a reasonable thought to make, that the concept of the tithe, and again, it's not legalism like you have to. We don't set up a standard and say you have to do this if you're a part of our church. You're not going to get fancy letters. Like if we just all do what the Bible says, nobody's going to have to ask you for anything. But we've got to know what the Bible says, right? And so th the fact is that that when you look backwards at when did the tithe start? The word tithe is first seen with Abraham 
as it relates to a priest named Melchizedek, who, by the way, some think was actually an appearance of Jesus Christ, for whatever that's worth, um, because we've never been able to fully identify him. But if you're, so that I make your, like, I want the Bible to kind of fit for you, it would be simple enough for us to say that the concept of the tithe, tithe goes away with the incoming of the new covenant and the blood of Jesus Christ, except for the fact that the tithe occurred before the law was given. You say, what do I mean? Well, we talk about like Moses and the law being given in Exodus and Leviticus and like some of that stuff with all those rules. and all. The tithe goes back way like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years prior to that to the patriarchs and to Abraham. Now, the idea of giving unto the Lord and worship goes all the way back to Adam and Eve's kids, Cain and Abel. Remember? That was a big snafu. I'm not sitting here trying to be legalistic with you. I'm trying to give you like a biblical background to understand how this thing works. And so what happened with Abraham is out of God's great blessing, there was an intentional desire to give a tenth of it to the Lord. Um, And we see that practiced over and over and over again. In the New Testament, what we saw with Jesus is we simply saw him affirming uh, the tithe by talking about it's great that you tithe on these little bitty things. Last time we were together, we talked about how they were just they were even tithing off like the herbs that would go into the, the, meat, the mint and the, the, the cumin and the dill. And he says, but you're missing out on justice and righteousness and mercy, these weightier things, things that matter more. We find that Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law, but here's what, here's what I think is interesting. Is, is you, is, and I'm, I gotta get through, the, I gotta, I'm gonna move fast on this, okay? But when it talks about bringing the full tithe to the storehouse, the reason it says bring the full tithe to the storehouse is they were only bringing in part. It was, it, it was not what God instructed them to do. The reason it would have mattered in the Old Testament is because they could only do what they did at the temple. Because the, the sons of Levi, the tribe that was assigned the priestly duties, they didn't have property. They weren't given property. So the only way they could do what they did was while all the other people pitching in to make it so they could do what they do. Right? And, and I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that in the New Testament era... For us to do what we do, the only way we can do what we do is by you bringing in to do as we do. I can go make tents. I can. I just can't go to make tents and do what we do. Does that make sense? Not all of it. And so uh, I'm telling you how it it fits together. Now, as you look at, at, at why that would have mattered, another piece would have been bring the full tithe to the storehouse. The storehouse is the place that you're fed from. So the idea would be that you bring the tithe. I'm giving you... Old school theology right here, but you bring the tithe to the place that you're spiritually being fed. Why? Because somehow there's got to be provision made to keep the place that feeds you feeding you. I would be, I'm not bashful in saying that I think Emerald Coast Fellowship is a place in the modern era that makes a difference in the community we live in. And we only make the difference in the community we live in because there are many of you that give sacrificially to make it happen. Like, I don't know if you know that or not, but like we operate completely and totally off of gifts that people give that are a part of a tithe and gifts they give above and beyond that that allow us to do and do more to make a difference in our community. That's it. Um, And so that's where all the operating uh, dollars come from. Now, so you see those concepts here. And he says, test me in it. I'm just going to tell you. I used to, when I was in Jacksonville for a few years, um, John Maxwell was the one that did this, uh, for those of you that know John Maxwell. But he, he was a pastor. He used to be a Methodist pastor. He encouraged pastors to basically do this promise challenge. And so I did that for a few years. And I never had anybody take me up on it. But the promise was always, hey, tithe for 90 days. And if you don't feel like God's blessed you, you come ask for your money back. Uh, you're supposed to laugh right, like right there. Think, ha, ha. We don't do that here, okay? Uh, but I tried it. I never had anybody that would come ask for their money back, right? Uh, and, and I can just tell you that I've done this my whole life, and I've never, I've never felt like that, that God didn't more than do right, okay? The Bible is full of God insisting on people trusting him for provision. Like, when we don't have to trust God for provision, that's when we get ourselves in trouble. Um, when you look at the story of the widow, And the prophet, uh, the widow of Zarephath and and, and her and her son not having enough. And he says, hey, bring me what you've got. And they bring her what they got. And it was just enough for her and her boy. And they were going to die soon because of the famine. And he said, give me, give me what you've got. So he, they gave her what they had and there was more there. And they gave her what they had, they gave away what they had to the prophet. There was more there. And day after day, God made provision. 
You see this kind of thing happen throughout the Bible where God is a God of provision. Like he wants us to trust him for provision. He doesn't want us to continually trust ourselves for provision. One of the things that's crazy in a way like I've never seen it since the storm and then the pandemic, here locally we've had to trust God for provision on a whole lot of levels in a way that we never would have, and it's re- required us to live by faith. If you remember in the, in, the, in the wilderness, we're talking about Exodus 16, they were given meat. They were a lot like people from northwest Florida, right? They didn't want just bread. Uh, and so he'd given them manna to sustain them. They're like, no, 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 no. We got to have meat. So they got quail. I'd have been asking for bacon. Like, like I'm saying, where's the bacon? Bring the bacon. Uh, and, and, and thankfully for all of us, we live under the new covenant. We can eat us some bacon. Everybody say bacon. There you go. They're awake. This is good. We can't talk about money, but we can talk about bacon. Um, and so here's, the, so here's the deal. Like God always made provision. We see in the New Testament that Jesus did the same thing. He showed them a miracle of provision. He did it at the wedding of Cana where they shouldn't have had any more. And yet they did. Some of you are like, woo, he's talking about the wedding. And I was, it, it's true. God made provision. We see it when Jesus fed in both instances in the New Testament, the 4,000 and the 5,000, when he took the, the loaves and the fishes and he just kept breaking it and kept breaking it and kept breaking it and kept multiplying and kept multiplying and kept multiplying. And those are moments where we can say, look, I ain't because you spun a deal. That's not because you're good. It's not because you knew how to do it or where it was going to come from or had it planned in advance. That was just God making provision. It was all him, and it was you living by faith that he'd make provision. That's his way. Now, we're going to look at that concept next week of sowing and reaping. And this is a concept that all of you need to, like I'm trying to give, we're partnering with families and parents. You need to know about sowing and reaping. I mean, any of you that have kiddos that are athletes that like soccer or baseball or football or, or uh, oh, we got hands going up now, like they're dancers or they're twirlers or whatever they do, they're not going to get any better if they don't put the time in. Like, it's just not how it works. You put the time in now and you get better over time, right? And the same way is true in almost every facet of life. And so there is this principle God's created in the world of sowing and reaping. And so this applies to giving as well, and it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And he says you sow now and you reap later more than what you sowed, and you, you reap what you sowed, and you reap, uh, you reap it later than you sowed. So there's this principle at play. And if we don't learn that, we're going to have a hard time in life because it's a real thing. But we also see in the the concept related to giving in the New Testament that Jesus gives us a little bit different picture of what's expected to us as those that serve under the lordship and the ownership of Jesus Christ. And I have to say this to you because it's true that we pretty much don't measure up in most every area as it relates to Christendom. And usually we know we don't. um, And sometimes we're we're, we're too okay with the fact that we don't. Let me give you some examples of this, okay? When we go to the uh, Sermon on the Mount, we look at the story that Jesus gave us, and it's just th- this is the concept. We really don't want the letter of the law. What we want is grace. Like, I have people sometimes ask me, Do you, should you give off the gross or should you give off the net? If we're having to ask that question, the heart's not right yet. Like, literally, if we're asking, I mean, do you really want to count the pennies and the nickels and the dimes with Jesus? I mean, there's others you might want to ask that of, but he's not the one. I want to deal with, I want to give, give him way more, be way more, I want him to be generous with me, so I want to be generous with him, right? And so, when we, when we look at Jesus and we look at, and, and see what he said, just look at the heart, the tenor of who Jesus was, right? So, we go over, we know that he talked a lot about finances, we know that there were those that on this issue, because ownership wasn't right, stewardship wouldn't be right. So the rich young ruler is an example of that, where he looked and he said, what must I do? And he said, well, I can see, he's essentially saying to him, I can see given, like, your stuff is in the way, so you go sell everything, and then, and then you, can, you, can, you can be saved. He's like, ooh, it's a sad day, because I ain't selling. And we find other instances where, like, stewardship, of individual, like how they place things ahead of God. That was an issue. So until ownership is right, our prioritization is the manager, like he's in charge. And what he's in charge means is that he's in charge. It means that he's in charge of your time. It means that he is master of, of finances. And, and that doesn't mean that you give them how I think you should. No, 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 that's not how that works. You and the Lord through the Holy Spirit, are looking at what the Word says, and you're cheerfully and without under obligation and without, without exacting, exacting the gift, I think is the way that the term is. is it's not an exaction. It's, it's basically you choosing to willfully do 
This isn't a tax. This isn't communism. Y'all know that, right? Like it's a it's a fundamental difference to willfully choose to guess. That's what makes it so de- like some of y'all that that actually work hard, you earn. You, you know, like, it, no, it's not a tax. That's what makes it different. And so when we look at the New Testament, we see Jesus give us a standard. And and here's what's interesting: when he he's not only told us that um, that we can't to serve two masters, and that where our treasure is, there is our, our heart going to be also. This is it's, it, it literally illustrates this idea that. Ownership's the big issue. You get ownership fixed, it's going to resolve everything else. Jesus, after telling us that we should be light before others and that they should see our good works and our Father in heaven, he begins to address issues. And he goes back to the old covenant and says, look, this is what you've heard before. You've heard before related to anger that you shouldn't murder, but I'm going to say to you that you shouldn't even think like, you go, like I wish they were dead. Uh-uh. If you even do that, you're guilty of the fact. If you look as a one, the Bible says not to commit adultery. He says, you've heard it said of old, but I say if you, you look in lust, you've, you've committed, you're like, ooh, he's raised his standard a lot. And we wouldn't really deny that he's raised his standard, would we? But then we, then, then we go and we look at like retaliation, like somebody does something to you, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, instead of old, turn the other cheek. And I'm giving you a picture here, but like if we're going based on what the word says, the word says you've heard it said of old, you shall not... Uh, that you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's, that's, that's the sort of standard used to be, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, here's the problem. For some of us, it, the Bible said it. We're like, Lord, I'm going to love some of my enemies, but not, not that one. You know, it says love your neighbor. Well, I, Lord, I know your word says love your neighbor, but I ain't loving that one. Well, that's a problem. And the reason it's a problem is because it means that God is not in charge. You've decided that in that area with that neighbor, I mean, we all got our issues, right? I'm, I mean, we're just talking real up in here. Like, you're like, well, well the Lord said not to gossip. Yeah, but it was true. And, and even though I didn't go to them, he said go to them directly. Well, I didn't go to them directly, but it was still true, God. I don't care what the word says. That's a bad attitude. You, but you understand that on these areas, we f- fall short of his intention that is well above. There's issues for us that we're like, well, I know he said forgive, but I ain't forgiving them. You don't know what they did to me. Well, the Lord does know what they did to you, and he told you to forgive. Like, he didn't, he didn't put categories out there and say, if they do this, then it doesn't matter anymore. Like, can I, I'm just going to, I'm going to be just like, it, well, God can forgive all. He expects us to. So I'm literally not unaware that what I'm telling you about finances is of the same ilk. He's putting a standard up there that is above what the law requires. And if I were to say anything, I would say that probably the starting point is the tenth. I mean, if we want to say what the tithe, I mean, that's a big place to begin, but the goal is to grow in it. You say, was well, that really the goal? I've been telling you for like a whole year, we want to press forward in faith and practice in Christianity and become more like Jesus. And if the Lord blesses you, why would you not give more to see more people come to know Christ? Like it literally says in, here's your verse, 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 8, Paul's taking up this offering. Why is he taking up an offer? Crazy thing that people do stuff together and they can do more together than they can do individually. Do you know that works? Like you and uh, Brandon, you and Amanda, all right? I'm not sure that yard work's on. Don't, don't hate me, Brandon, but I'm not sure if yard work is on, the, on the, uh, the list or the agenda today. I've been encouraged to spend some quality time with my wife uh, working on a flower bed later today, okay? We can get more done together than I can all by myself, right? Like I go out there and cut those hedges and then they, there's there's stuff to pick up. Well, we can get more done quickly than together. And if we get a whole team, we can get it done real fast. Well, as a church family, you might not like the concept of an organized church. But let's just get to the bottom line. We can do more for health care in the world than any other uh, imaginable organization. Just look at the hospitals that started in a Christian name. Just look at the educational institutions that started it. When we do stuff together, we can do a lot. And we can do some stuff in Bay County to make a huge difference if we collectively do it together. This is the picture of God's body working together, and we can do because because we bring forth to the storehouse the, the, by faith the gift God's given out of a worship of provision that he's made in our life and by faith, and then we can do more together through it. Like I have full expectation that I can encourage some people this week, but y'all together going to encourage a whole bunch more people, right? And so this is the concept that we see in the scriptures in, uh, hang on. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Let me read the verse. I'm going to run out of time here in a minute. It was worth it though, man. Wasn't that a cool moment at the altar? Um, he says to us, uh, oh, yeah. 
He says, you're going to grow in some stuff. He didn't say it like that. He says in uh, chapter 8, verse 7, as you excel in everything, you, want, you excel in spe- faith and in speech and in knowledge, right? We're growing to be more like Christ. In earnestness, in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Listen, giving's a discipline. Generosity is a discipline. And some of you today, look, I, I want you to, to know that I'm aware of some stuff. I've, I've worked with enough families over the decades I've been involved in ministry to know that that there, it, there's a family involved. There's people, and, and one believer and another believer, and they, they come from different backgrounds and different experiences and different degrees. Or It's not that one has great faith, therefore they're generous. One may be really generous and the other one really gossipy, right? And so when you go home and say, well, I wish you were as generous as me, was, well, I'm glad I'm not as gossipy as you are. I mean, like, like, it's not like we hold it over one another's head. But together, together we in every area, we want to align our life with Christ because he's owner and king and we want to we want to line life up. And so we want to take some steps forward. And so what I'm doing today with you is saying, hey, look, the Bible tells us that we should be generous. It tells us that, 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 that we should acknowledge that God is king and author of, of all of our life, including our finances. And here's what's the problem. Sometimes because we're wealthy, we think God's the one, like, like, look at what I've accrued. That's where pride comes from. Sometimes we think because we come from a poor place, we're material, like we can't trust God for provision, and we look around and, 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 and we struggle with faith there. Both folks deal with contentment issues. But what we should be doing is trusting God with it. Trusting God by setting aside each week. Like that's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. It says there that he's taking up an offering, right? He's talking to the church at Corinth. He's got he's crazy. Like Paul had this crazy idea that if all the Gentile churches the people that were Greek that the Jews hated because they were Gentiles and barely even getting into heaven like Jews are first and if they know Christ, they can go to heaven. He's looking at them and saying, hey, you know how mean they were to y'all? Well, now they're getting picked on because they're Christians and they're Jews. Let's take up an offering, all us Greek churches, Gentile churches together, and let's send it and help them because they're hungry. Now, some of y'all, I already told you, I mean, I ain't helping my enemy. I'm going to love my, my, my neighbor and hate my enemy. That's what I'm going to Paul's like, hey, let's collectively do this together. He said, how can you do it? Well, the way you do it is you put a little aside each week. And so he gives them that reminder. And for us, it's a reminder. Here's what the truth is. The truth is that in any area, if there's not accountability and somebody doesn't say, hey, we need to get better at this, then we just tend to not. Those that have said, I don't believe in organized church, typically are folks that don't grow spiritually because they're not in the Word. They don't share their faith as much. And can I just say it? They don't give to Christian causes. You say, what do you mean? Generally, people that don't believe in giving to the church also don't give generously. They give some, but they don't give generously to help others. It usually ends up meaning it stays in their pocket. I know that sounds harsh, but I think it's a reality. Like, usually it's a justification of of not being generous. In America, most people um, are really, really, really wealthy compared to most of the rest of the world that's poor, that's impoverished. And we're getting wealthier. We're not getting less wealthy. I'm not chastising you. I'm saying that we should be intentionally generous because together we can do amazing things with it. Now, I feel like I ought to offer, because I ain't coming back here very often. But I feel like I ought to be honest enough to just tell you some things I wish. We, we don't, I don't ever want to do a fundraiser. I don't think a church ought to have to do a fundraiser. And if everybody learns to do what the Bible says do, we won't ever have a problem. Y'all have been way, way more faithful and responded. In the last half of the year, we paid the initial tab on that, um, the modulars, like just in the last few weeks of the year. And y'all have continued to be generous. But here's the deal. I would love not only to pay for every bit of that as we go and to make adjustments in-house as we free up some classrooms. Like, I don't want to have to come say, hey, let's do a special offering for this. I would love, this is a dream of mine, brother, and I said this in the first round. Um, my, our elders love me. I, like, I, I, I believe that. But sometimes that, I think they look at me like I'm a little bit naive because uh, I really, like, 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 bless his heart, I really believe that, that we could build a whole new space down here in cash. Like, like, why should we have to go at begging for funds? We just let's just everybody pray and look at the word and be shaped and do what God would say to do. I think it can happen. Like, I, and I literally don't think we're that far from it happening, but it only happens when we say, let's do something the community would look at and say, man, God's amazing. 
Like, not they're good, but look what God's doing. And the idea is that we just stay focused on feeding kids. We stay focused on seeing uh, those that don't have water have clean water. Is it so that, that we can all get rich? And, no, that's not the point. It's never been the point. I'm grateful for for 20 plus years of strong financial leadership here. I'm grateful that we can be fiscally responsible. I'm grateful that we can be uh, like frugal so that we can be generous. I, and I know I'm a couple minutes over, but let me, let me just share this with you. This past week, I was listening to a little bit to Dave Ramsey. Okay, he's more frugal than me, just FYI, but, but, but he's, he's, he's sharp. And, and he made this statement. He said, you know, inflation is an interesting thing. I think some of you business people like this. Inflation is an interesting thing. You know, inflation, and he quoted Warren Buffett. You may not like Warren Buffett. It's okay, don't judge me, but I like the statement. He said, Warren Buffett made the comment that inflation identifies very quickly the people that are skinny dipping. And I thought about y'all, y'all to, to chuckle right there. This is, this is funny. Because what he said was, you know, in a good economy, everybody's just going along, and if we're not disciplined and not being intentional, literally just being intentional about where, where's my life going? Where's my time going? Where are my dollars going? Well, the next thing you know, you've got 13 subscriptions that you hadn't used in a year and a half, two years, and, and it's just no big deal, and you got money going out here and money going out there. Well, when inflation hits, now all of a sudden we figure out who's sloppy, right? Because the tide goes down, and now we know who's skinny dipping, right? Like who's just renting versus who's owning? Who, who really is doing what's right with the dollars available? When we talk about stewardship, what we're really talking about is being judicious, being honorable before God with the dollars available in such a way that he is king and he is Lord. Man, that's all God wants for you. And that's all my heart is for you. And everything else solves itself, but it starts with the question of ownership. If you have questions like, mechanic, like how do I do this and how do I do that, listen to me. My prayer is that you make a plan to get from where you are, to, like where you're at, to where you need to be. Like with the Lord. I'm going to say it in a way that I say it to folks that are living together, but they're not married. Like, I, I hope I can even actually say this. I'm like, hey, my issue is not where you are right now. My issue is how to get you from where you're at to where you need to be. Right? Like, I ain't here to judge you. I'm just here to tell you we're going to open the Bible. We're going to look at what does the Bible say. And then when we see where we are and we identify, okay, how do we get from where we are to where we need to be? And so in any area of your life, including the one of finances, that's really the heart of it. Now, here's what's crazy. We had this crazy moment at the altar. And then I hit you with all of that. I'm going to leave you with a final story. And it may hit you like a ton of bricks. Um, a number of years ago, I had a conversation. I was pretty fresh out of seminary with an older person. And look, I've grown a lot in this area because I grew up in this area. And it was a conversation about mixed race marriage. And I gave them, man, I'm, they were firm that it, the Bible's against it. And I took, and listen, I took them verse by verse by, and I won bad. Why? Because the Bible is clear that God does not say that marriages should not be mixed racially. He doesn't say it. When I got done, this man that I loved, did love then, love now. In frustration, he said to me, well, it may not say it, but it should. with deadly seriousness that is our problem on so many issues from finances to forgiveness to a jillion other things because when God has given us a clear picture if he is owner we no longer get to say he's not in charge I am merely a steward of the time and the life and the breath that he's given to me and the fact that he was and is and is to come and that I'm not in charge, oh, <laughs> doesn't that take a relief? Okay, I know I got to go. Ownership, guys. Do you really want to claim ownership of that little area that you really need to let go of so that he can be steward? My heart is just for you to do what he's told us to do in all areas. Stand together with me as we pray. Thank you for letting me take a little bit extra of I, can I say God's time? It's his. <laughs> Lord God, thank you for how you have moved in this space today. Lord, we have open text. I pray that our hearts have been encouraged. Lord, I'm hopeful of what you're going to do this week. Lord, I am grateful for your provision, past, present, future. 
I'm confident that you have a plan that's bigger than us. I'm confident that we are a part of what you are doing, and I'm grateful to see it happening. Lord, we pray your blessing on these families. We pray you would help us to navigate the issue first of ownership, and then in the world in which we live, the opportunity to do better and to be more like you in every area, including excelling in this grace of giving that Christ may be known. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.